So I, I thought Hyun would be saying a lot more about Korea than, than me, but I think we can't not uh, touch on it as we begin, given where we are at the moment. Uh, just to appreciate that that line uh, was drawn uh, by a fellow named Dean Rusk um, when he was a colonel in the military in uh, August 1945. Um, and I wanted to put this slide in here also to point to uh, the Korean Peninsula's uh, importance in kind of global geostrategic terms, uh, in that uh, for the United States it serves as one of the toeholds uh, on the uh, eastern edge of Eurasia. Uh, take a look at Brzezinski in terms of the importance of that. And for the Chinese, uh, it's obviously uh, uh, the, the path uh, uh, for invasion uh, into Manchuria and, and the control of, of major portions of, of China. So it's, it's a critically uh, important area. Um, uh, the other element, is, as you know, is uh, we just had the um, uh, simulated nuclear attacks against uh, North Korea uh, by US B-52s and uh, B-2 uh, bomber. Uh, and if you read, as I said last night, if you read the North Korean statements carefully, what you see is that until these flights took place, even with their nuclear test, their policy in terms of the possibility of negotiations uh, with the United States to eliminate their nuclear arsenals was ambiguous. Uh, but after the overflights, uh, they've been very, very clear uh, that they are now a, a nuclear power and there's no, no turning back. Um, I wanted to kind of point to, this is probably out of order here, I wanted to point to a number of areas in, in, the, uh, in the region which are um, uh, tinderboxes. Uh, the thing you see here, because way back when, uh, when I was studying with Corey Makabagal and Bill Clinton, um, uh, we were taught that uh, international relations uh, is, uh, study of international relations is analogous to studying the rules of the game among mafia families. Uh, and it doesn't have to be that way, but that's the way it's, it's practiced. And what you see here with that red line is what the Chinese call the uh, nine dot line, uh, which they're essentially making claims, ambiguous claims, uh, to the entire, uh, almost the entire South China Sea, uh, which includes uh, stepping on the claims of countries like the Philippines, Malaysia, Vietnam, uh, in an intense struggle over resources. Uh, and it's through this area uh, that the oil from the Middle East uh, that Rashid Khalidi was talking about gets to fuel the East Asian economy. So this is a, a major, major area of, um, of tension. Um, here, uh, just kind of running around, I, I had a, a laser pointer that I'll have with me at the moment. Uh, but to, to look at the, oh, we have this down here, we're going to jump down one more. Uh, the Senkaku Islands, we've, we almost went to war this fall uh, with competing claims between China uh, and Japan uh, over basically uninhabited rocks. Uh, but this again has to do with um, uh, oil and natural gas. Uh, in, the, in the seabeds around it, uh, and also in relationship to uh, being able to maintain naval and air forces um, uh, relative power in the case of a war over, over Taiwan. Uh, so it's a pretty intense, intense area. Uh, and uh, here we go. Uh, just to uh, appreciate in the area, if you look um, uh, along the coast between um, uh, China uh, from Taiwan on up through uh, Japan, it's called the um, the Inland Sea, and this is the area where uh, China feels the greatest vulnerability in terms of uh, uh, attacks or um, uh, you know, foreign interventions. Uh, I want to tell a quick little story, because it's taking too much time, but in terms of continuity of policy. Uh, in 1998, um, there was a small little clip in a, a Japanese newspaper that I read uh, that said that uh, Ezra Vogel and Joseph Nye we're going to be going to a NGO conference in Tokyo uh, to um, meet with their NGO peers. To appreciate that um, Nye had been number three in the Pentagon and Vogel was uh, the head of Asian intelligence uh, in the first Clinton administration. Uh, and both uh, uh, have offices and teach 
down the road from where I have my office in Cambridge or Harvard. And I knew Nye wouldn't speak to me, but I wrangled the meeting with, with Vogel. And I asked him, what's your goal for this, for this uh, meeting? He said, well, I want to negotiate a new security arrangement for Northeast Asia. And I said, well, how do you do that? And he said, what we do is we prepare uh, uh, and threaten to completely surround China with missile defenses that can neutralize all of their missiles. Neutralize all of their missiles. And then we say, now let's make a deal. I said, well, well what's, what's the deal? Uh, and he said that China adopt no more aggressive military doctrine, no more aggressive, uh, deploy no more aggressive weapons than it already has. And I said, that's, that's interesting. It would leave the Seventh Fleet it would leave the hundreds of military bases the United States has in Japan, Korea. Uh, um, at that point, I think the visiting forces have gone back into force in the Philippines. Uh, it would leave our uh, nuclear armed subs in place, our monopolization of, uh, of uh, militarization of space. And Vogel turned to me and said, so? <laughs> so? Uh, and that's, that's the game that's being played with the, uh, with, with the pivot. Um, what I want to say here. There are other tensions that we can point to um, uh, between, again, uninhabited rocks between uh, Korea and Japan, um, uh, which has been the, the source of considerable uh, tension. Uh, both countries, th th that island is in some ways uh, essential to the identity of both countries. Uh, and, uh, and given the history of Japanese colonization of Korea, it's been a, a very important uh, uh, touch point. Uh, which brings us then uh, to, um, uh, brings us to, to the Obama administration. Um, Hyun and I had a meeting earlier this year with Frank Genuzzi, who's now at, um, uh, now at Amnesty International. But he used to be the top senior staff uh, on Asia Pacific for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, and uh, just over four years ago, uh, we hosted a, a delegation from China to meet with a number of figures in Washington so they could, in a sense, take the temperature of, of what the Obama administration would be. And, and Januzzi was very clear. He said that China isn't making new claims, but is now enforcing claims from 1919. And it's a tectonic shift. So we're in a period of, uh, as I think we all are appreciating, of a fundamental change. Uh, so then in November of 2011, to deal with this change, uh, Hillary Clinton published uh, uh, an article in, uh, in foreign, foreign Policy magazine. And just to quote uh, from it briefly, uh, she said, as the war in Iraq winds down and America begins to withdraw from Afghanistan, the United States stands at a pivot point. One of the most important tasks over the next decade will be to lock in substantially increased investment, diplomatic, economic, strategic, and otherwise, in the Asia Pacific region. This was then followed by a series of trips by the uh, Defense Secretary, the um, uh, Head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and Obama himself, all of whom uh, essentially reiterated uh, that point. Um, I haven't mentioned Joe and I before, uh, and he basically has been um, the eminence grease behind U.S.-Asia Pacific policy for um, well over 20 years. Uh, it's worth reading what he, what he says. In the New York Times he wrote, that Asia will return to its historic status with more than half of the world's population and half of the world's economic output. America must be present there. Markets and economic power rest on political frameworks and American military power provides that framework. Let's say a little bit about the historical precedence for this, but you know, there's the Tom Friedman piece that you know, um, we don't have McDonald's without McDonnell Douglas. It's the same, the same, the same piece. But uh, the other thing which has been interesting about Nye is he has written and warned that twice during the 20th century, um, the dominant powers, the United States and Britain, failed to integrate the rising powers. Uh, Japan and Germany into their systems, uh, resulting in catastrophic uh, world wars. And so the goal is to, if you will, shape and manage China's rise uh, rather than fully oppose it uh, in order to bring it more into uh, the systems dominated by the, the trilateral, trilateral powers. 
Uh, but at the same time, the United States is quite prepared uh, to go a bit further. There's a new and, I think, important book uh, by Jeffrey Bader. He was uh, the top uh, Asian Pacific guy at the National Security Council uh, during the, the first Obama administration. Uh, and uh, while saying the United States wants to and actually attempted to develop a G2 relationship with, uh, uh, with, with, with China, he also uh, writes that the U.S. is committed to beat back any Chinese bid for hegemony in the Asia Pacific, of course, that's to maintain our, our own. And the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff has said that the U.S. military may be obliged to overtly confront China just as it faced down the Soviet Union. <coughs> Moving along here. Oh, yeah, this, this other interesting piece here. Well, the, what's the one I have here? Oh, okay, come back here. Um, uh, Donilon, who is now the, the national, you know, top national security advisor, uh, basically laid out four pillars of U.S. and Asia Pacific strategy uh, to strengthen our alliances, and I'll come back to that in considerable depth, uh, forging deeper partnerships with uh, emerging powers, uh, China, India, Indonesia, uh, building a constructive relationship with China. There's some very interesting dynamics going on right now between the United States and China in relationship to what's happening in North Korea. Uh, and uh, strengthening regional institutions, uh, APEC, um, uh, ASEAN plus three, and, and so forth. We can come back and clarify some of this uh, in Q&A. Uh, and there's another interesting book uh, recently out, uh, Robert Kaplan's The Revenge of Geography. Um, and among the things that he, 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 he writes there, as you'll see in this slide, uh, China is a rising and still <coughs> immature power obsessed with the territorial humiliation. It's been 150 years of Western colonialism uh, in, in China, and it was uh, pretty nasty. Um, he also goes on to say, China is not remotely capable of directly challenging the U.S. militarily. Uh, their aim is dissuasion, uh, that the U.S. Navy uh, in the future will think twice as it expands and three times about getting in between the first island chain and the Chinese coast. So they want, you know, just as we're concerned about what happens in the Caribbean or between Cuba and uh, Florida uh, on the coast uh, in California, uh, they're, they're nervous about what's taking place on their, uh, on their periphery. Uh, we're dealing with a situation, you know, where there's history, right? I mean, those of us in the United States, we, we like to um, uh, ignore history and, you know, think what's only important is what's happened in the last year. But to understand, to, to really deeply understand what's going on in the region, uh, the need to understand that we're dealing on one level with uh, legacies from the Cold War, uh, among them uh, North Korea's fears of the U.S. and both Korea's fears uh, of, of Japan. Um, you know, in the Korean War, the United States destroyed 99% of all the buildings in North Korea um, uh, to flatten the country. Um, uh, you know, people, people remember. Um, uh, continued, uh, continued and deepening efforts by the U.S. to reinforce its hegemony, which we've talked about. Uh, there's also a, a degree of, of basically mercantile competition. Uh, who gets the money? Um, you know, between all, all the countries involved here, it gets, uh, uh, it gets kind of interesting in the age of neoliberalism. Uh, and you have then the intersection of great power competition, the United States and, um, and China, uh, with uh, all kinds of regional tensions just on the margins of it is a Vietnamese woman we work with uh, who, who, you know, the, the, one of the great stupidities of the Vietnam War on top of everything else uh, was forgetting that, that Vietnam's major threat for, you know, a millennium uh, was China. Uh, and as she said, you know, uh, the small countries in the region will suffer when the big powers, the United States and China, are, are at loggerheads with one another, but they'll also be in danger uh, when they make deals at the expense of the smaller nations. Uh, so then, a little bit of, of history. Um, the United States' involvement uh, with, with East Asia um, began you know, with the whaling uh, and uh, with the opium trade. Uh, our current Secretary of State, uh, Kerry, is actually a Forbes. Uh, part of the Forbes fortune uh, came from selling Turkish opium uh, in, um, in China. Um, Back at, back at Georgetown, we had a great professor who we later learned was the principal, um, much later, the principal uh, ghostwriter for uh, John Kennedy's Profiles in Courage. And he gave a great lecture about the opening, if you will, of the United States uh, overseas uh, imperial, uh, uh, 
ambition. Uh, to appreciate, in the 1890s, the United States was in an economic uh, depression. Um, and uh, the idea was if the United States could capture a major part of the Chinese market with you know, all those millions of people to buy American goods, uh, you could stop the protests in the streets by the unemployed workers and people organizing unions uh, by selling to them, which would make the factories have to work full time, which would put people back to work uh, and create what they call social peace, also make huge profits for the owners. Um, and you also had, going all the way back to the 1850s, uh, how many people here have seen the, the film about Lincoln? Uh, so you remember Seward, right? In, in the 1850s, Seward said if the United States was going to replace Britain as the world's dominant power, uh, we had to first control Asia. Uh, we couldn't go the southern route uh, of <coughs> island hopping because other more powerful colonial powers controlled it. Uh, so you know, Seward got us Alaska, the northern route. Uh, but in the 1890s, we had built the navy that could compete with the British. Uh, so when somebody sank the Maine uh, uh, in, in, in Havana Harbor, uh, that was the excuse to, on the one hand, conquer uh, uh, Puerto Rico and Cuba, uh, consolidate control over northern Latin America, and at the same time to uh, conquer uh, Philippines, Guam, and ex Hawaii, and get the southern route that was needed uh, for coaling stations uh, to get to the, the China market. Uh, let me move these pages along. Uh, so, so you know, we had we had the wars, the conquest of the Philippines, uh, which went on for quite quite some time. Uh, I think it's important to understand the 1920s, I mean, you know, history is the foundation for all the rest of it, right? In the 1920s, you have the Washington Treaty, uh, which basically is when the United States, Japan, and Britain agreed on what the size of their Pacific navies will be, you know, the company of competing empires in the region. And then to understand the, uh, the U.S. war with, with uh, Japan as basically being a war between competing colonial powers. In fact, the debate in Japan uh, in the period of the 1930s had been whether they should expand their empire under the umbrella of the British uh, uh, country with one-tenth the uh, uh, gross national product of the United States uh, went for the whole melon uh, and uh, suffered the consequences. Um, and then you have the period after that uh, in which uh, the United States basically controls the entire region. The Pacific is called the uh, American Lake. Uh, we create governments in, we basically took, among other things, a class A war criminal, uh, Kishi, um, and made him prime minister of Japan. Uh, so in 1960, he could ram through an extension of the U.S.-Japan alliance that had been imposed in secret uh, on the Japanese as a condition for uh, ending the, um, uh, the formal military occupation. I know I'm covering an awful lot here uh, quickly, but i try to give a, a quick overview. Um, Vietnam. Um, you know, absolutely, I mean, a genocidal war, right? Um, uh, Four million Vietnamese killed, maybe another two million Cambodians uh, and, and Laotians. Um, and now the reality is that um, Vietnam is, I'm not supposed to say this, but uh, Vietnam is functionally a tacit ally of the United States militarily. Uh, and then we have uh, the history of U.S. nuclear threats in order to maintain the domination of the region, four times with Vietnam, like three or four times with China, nine times with, with Korea. I mean, you don't have an empire uh, without being brutal and threatening, threatening the worst. Well, and of course, this last one was just within the last week or two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so moving down here, trying to move through this quickly. Um, yeah, so in the new in the new circumstance, what the United States is doing with the pivot. Um, the, the new uh, uh, U.S. Um, uh, strategic doctrine uh, says there are essentially two areas of the world which are central to U.S. Uh, power. Uh, the Persian Gulf, which Rashid Khalidi was talking about, and Asia Pacific. Um, go back to, to the night and I quote. So the uh, plan is to have 60% of the U.S. Navy, 60% uh, of the U.S. Air Force stationed in and around uh, uh, the Asia Pacific uh, region for domination. Um, there's a major important paper done by uh, Nye and Armitage. Armitage, you know, the Republican um, <coughs> evidence agrees and the two have cooperated a whole lot on, on Asia policy. Uh, they did a paper in August uh, for the Center for Strategic and International Studies 
uh, and basically, uh, took the title of it here, um, basically about the need for uh, deepening and securing the U.S. Uh, Japanese military alliance for the, for the coming period. Uh, there, Kevin and I were talking before, there was a, a during the, the, the brief rule of the uh, Demo Democratic Party of Japan, uh, the first uh, Prime Minister, Hatayama, uh, had visions of, of equalizing Japan's relationship between the United States uh, and with China. He talked about the creation of an East Asia uh, community, which did include the United States. Uh, he promised to get a major uh, uh, air base in the United States, has an Okinawa out. Uh, and I think the United States uh, quietly helped uh, to encourage his, uh, his ouster. Uh, and uh, in part, the, the, the renewing of the, of the alliance now uh, is to make up for that. In the paper, they say the major challenge for Japan right now is uh, whether it will uh, choose to remain a tier one nation or whether it allow itself to become a tier two nation, uh, weaker, maybe less, less allied with the United States, less the United States giving less in its direction. And when Prime Minister Abe, who in fact is Kishi the war criminal, his grandson, when he, when he came to the United States a couple of months ago, he explicitly said, explicitly said, Japan will remain a tier one nation. Uh, so I mean, this, he's probably the most nationalist and most militarist uh, prime minister uh, uh, since, since 1945. It's going to be interesting. The other interesting thing to, to say about that is I, as I run quickly, in the Armitage and I paper, they talk about the need for a uh, resource alliance. Um, and the, um, uh, uh, the idea is that um, uh, the alliance with Japan is now to be a global alliance. Uh, even after Fukushima, the United States is pressing Japan uh, to go back to a full use of nuclear power to join the United States in uh, exporting nuclear power plants. Um, uh, you have now the Japanese government and the U.S. are negotiating uh, new <coughs> Japanese defense guidelines. Now we think of Japan, right, with its peace constitution, Article 9, uh, no, no military, no war. Japan is already the sixth biggest military spender in the world. Uh, it has a navy which is far more powerful uh, than the Chinese Navy. Uh, it has missiles that can go to Mars, uh, and it's uh, sitting on massive tons of, uh, of plutonium, right? Uh, so it's interesting. Um, uh, the other part of that uh, resource alliance, uh, and, and Abi followed up with it when he was here, is greater Japanese dependence uh, on our fracked gas uh, and, um, and actually investment uh, to, to help make more of that gas available and to help subsidize that in the United States. There's an, Okinawa remains a um, uh, uh, kind of the, the spur in the, in, in the whole alliance structure. Um, a long history to Okinawa, but in, in brief just to say that um, uh, it's been sacrificed for the main islands. Uh, the biggest concentrations of U.S. military bases are there, have been there since since 45. Uh, in the, Futenda base, which is sort of a focal point, is a major air base in the center of a major city. It's like the hole in a donut, uh, with airplanes taking off literally right next to the schools. I've been in the schools. Uh, over people's homes, when a helicopter crashes into the local college, uh, the, the Japanese police can't get there uh, because the U.S. Marines are there. They broke the place off, and we control it. Uh, crime, especially sexual assaults, are very common. Uh, it's been a brutal, brutal uh, occupation. Uh, but then to move uh, to uh, South Korea. Um, again, the, the vision in the, in the U.S. doctrine right now uh, is that South Korea is also going to be part of uh, U.S. global alliance structures. Uh, its uh, forces are to join, as, as they did with uh, Iraq, uh, uh, rather out of, of the area. Um, what else I want to say here quickly? Um, yeah, um, missing on the, uh, back, back during the, the time of the Chinon uh, uh, crisis when it seems that, that North Korea probably uh, sank a, a Japanese ship, uh, you know, South Korea was you know, moving with military exercises to respond and joint exercises with the United States. And if I go way back here to the map, 
here. Um, what you can see right up here in the Yellow Sea between uh, Korea and China. Uh, that's, that's the entryway uh, to Beijing. It's sort of like the Chesapeake Bay uh, into uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, the Chinese said, look, and, and what you're going to do, uh, don't send the nuclear power, nuclear capable George Washington uh, into this area. Uh, and that's exactly what the United States did. Uh, I was in a meeting where the, uh, the talk where the former U.S. ambassador to China, uh, R. Stapleton Roy, said, we, choked, we, we poked China in the eye because we could. Um, you know, how you discipline the rest of the world is to uh, show and threaten what you can, can do. The United States is now uh, building uh, a new base in, uh, on Jeju Island. One of the, uh, again, Jim will probably say something more about that. Uh, a place of natural beauty, a, a, a United Nations uh, uh, natural uh, site, uh, destroying the reefs and destroying the lives of the communities in a part of Japan where the U.S. and the South Korean government um, in the immediate post-war period killed thousands and thousands of people uh, who were trying to uh, affirm their, their, their communal uh, farming and, and community structures. Uh, but the alliances go uh, way beyond. Uh, Philippines, uh, as we speak, uh, U.S. Um, uh, uh, Philippine uh, military exercises are, are going on. Uh, and to appreciate that one of the things that's, that complicates the whole arrangement here is that with that uh, Chinese nine, nine dotted line, uh, some of the, and uh, there have been military skirmishes with uh, China and, uh, and the Philippines at sea, same with China and, the, and Vietnam. Uh, some of these governments have encouraged the United States to come in uh, and to off balance uh, rising Chinese power. So it's a complicated, uh, you're more complicated than we like to think about. Uh, Guam or Guam. Uh, Guam, you know, conquered in 1898. Um, the first time I went to Japan uh, many years ago, there were representatives of the Guam Landowners Association. They brought two maps with them. Uh, one showed where the best drinking water, the best farmland, uh, and the best fishing waters were. The other showed where the U.S. bases were. Same map. Uh, now the U.S. is further expanding uh, those bases, seeing Guam is a hub and a fallback for when we eventually get pushed out of Okinawa. Um, and we're putting now more Marines in, expanding the, the air base. Uh, and the uh, indigenous people there, the Chamorros, uh, are getting crushed under this. It's a, it's, it's, it's a crime, needless to say. Uh, Singapore, down at the end of, of Malaysia, um, we have bases there, deep, deep military cooperation. Uh, Vietnam, uh, the, the, the senior uh, Vietnamese general, uh, landed on a jet on the on the on, on, on the USS George Washington aircraft carrier during military exercises as a way of showing what the new relationship is. Uh, we have a deepening uh, military partnership with uh, Indonesia, uh, Australia, where we've long had spy bases. We now just moved another 2,500 uh, Marines uh, to um, uh, Darwin, uh, and the idea here is that it's not only a relationship with the Pacific. But the Indian Ocean is also becoming uh, increasingly important strategically. Um, New Zealand has just renewed military cooperation with the United States after the break over their declaration of being nuclear free. Huge blow to the Chinese uh, was the turning of uh, Burma, uh, Myanmar. Uh, so now we have developed military to military cooperation uh, there on their southern flank, and they had seen that as their path into the Indian Ocean. Uh, India. Uh, one of the rising powers. Uh, you'll recall that the first state visit uh, for the Obama administration was Prime Minister Singh of India. I mean, they laid out the red carpet, the blue carpet, the gold carpet, everything uh, for this. And Obama said at the time, uh, India, uh, the U.S. relationship with India is, quote, one of the defining partnerships of the 21st century. And again, the idea here is to uh, encircle uh, China. Uh, with uh, military alliances, military bases, uh, it goes up into central, goes up into Central Asia, where uh, you know, we're planning to keep our um, keep our forces uh, in in Afghanistan for for quite some time. And there's a I have a slide here somewhere that lists the, um, uh, the NATO partnerships uh, with uh, Japan, with uh, Korea, uh, and other 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 countries. 
uh, kind of then building off of what um, uh, we heard last night, um, you know, the whole new weapon systems, right, that are being developed, uh, space, but uh, also the um, F-35, the most expensive uh, uh, built war system uh, ever built, I mean, $1.5 trillion uh, for the, the next level of, of jets designed basically for, for China. So now, you know, we, we haven't been thinking, we, our minds are still so uh, uh, locked in, in, in the Gulf War, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, that we haven't been following that the driving edge here in terms of military preparations uh, is, is to deal with China. And then you have the economic uh, dimension of it. Uh, the United States is now involved in, um, in negotiations, Japan, Korea, um, Philippines, uh, Vietnam, uh, several of the uh, uh, Latin American countries, uh, to create what's called a Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership. The idea is to <coughs> negotiate the, if you will, highest or maybe the lowest level uh, free trade area. Uh, and the, the purpose here is twofold. Uh, one is to wean these countries from dependence on China for the longer term, but China's not involved. Uh, and, uh, and secondly, to more deeply integrate their economies and their societies uh, with that of the United States uh, so that we can uh, marginalize the China in the, in the process. And there's a similar negotiating process going on now, the United States and the European Union. Whether these will succeed, we don't know. But the idea is to create essentially the, the trilateral uh, vision that Brzezinski had you know, back before Carter was elected, uh, again, to contain and have leverage in relationship to, uh, to China. I'm coming toward the end, I'm going to make it here. Um, so then in the midst of, uh, I've, I've left out tons, I'm sure. Um, in the midst of all of this, then the question is, um, so what, what are the alternatives? How do we think differently from, from what's there? And so I want to want to suggest uh, several that have been put out some by by Kevin Rudd, the former Prime Minister of Australia, uh, and others that are uh, out there. Uh, one is, you know, we, we should be thinking at a minimum in terms of, of common security. Uh, this was the paradigm that was used to uh, end the the, uh, the Cold War with the Soviet Union. Uh, basically, it comes out of the thinking of. Uh, Olaf Palme, the former Swedish Prime Minister, was murdered. Um, uh, with the idea that, uh, as we see now with, 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 with North Korea, when one side takes an action in, in what it says is its own defense, uh, new weapon system or whatever, uh, that in turn frightens the other side, leading it to take action that again uh, uh, frightens the other side, and you have a spiraling arms race. And so the, what was envisioned out of that was that uh, you name each, 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 each party to, to these tensions, uh, names what their greatest fear is. Uh, and you then negotiate in ways that address those fears. Uh, and basically the Cold War ended uh, before the fall of the Berlin Wall, before um, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union with the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Agreement. That was what grew out of um, if you will, the international movement uh, to freeze the nuclear arms race. So I, I think moving to a common security framework, it's not, it's not utopia, it's not human security, but it's a way to prevent uh, catastrophic wars. Um, there's talk of, of negotiating a new Shanghai communique. Uh, U.S.-Chinese relations are uh, built on a series of, of deep understandings on, on central interests uh, that grew out of Nixon's uh, initial trip and then um, uh, Carter's recognition of, of China, uh, and, and the idea here is that we and the uh, Chinese negotiate a, um, an agreement uh, for how we're going to relate to one another uh, for years into the future. Uh, we have, although it's, it's uh, been on the rocks for a while, in Northeast Asia, a framework of the six-party talks, um, the two Koreas, uh, uh, China, Russia, uh, the United States, um, Japan. Uh, that can be the, the basis for uh, negotiating uh, both, both the uh, resolution of the crisis in, in, uh, in Korea, uh, but also deeper even to the possibility of a Northeast Asia nuclear weapons free zone. Uh, could be a framework for those negotiations. Um, 
there's East Asia Summit, another international function. There's the ASEAN plus one, the ASEAN plus three. Um, so that's the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. But it's a structure where negotiations can take place. And I think uh, as we're looking for cutting edges in terms of popular movements, uh, we have what's variously called move the money, right? Uh, in Massachusetts, we had a referendum, uh, the budget for all referendum, where uh, people in in every one of the 91 towns and cities uh, where this question was put on the ballot, the uh, question was, uh, uh, do you favor protecting essential social services, uh, investing in job creation infrastructure, um, increasing taxes on the wealthy, those making over $250,000, and cutting the military budget? In every one of the 91 towns and cities, including Boston, where it appeared on the ballot, it won. We didn't lose a single town or city. Uh, and and you know, this is this another way of coming at the dangers of war, but also meeting our more fundamental human needs. I think is 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 that Judith LeBlanc I can be in a panel uh, shortly to, uh, talking about that. And then in terms of of, um, of of some focal points, I mean right now we need to call for an end to the um, uh, the war games with uh, South Korea, uh, which in part uh, would spark uh, the North Korean uh, responses. Um, with 216,000 uh, uh, South Korean and U.S. Um, uh, forces uh, basically preparing invasion of, of North Korea. Um, uh, also, the campaign you will be talking about uh, of moving from uh, the armistice. We never really did, did end the, the Korean War, moving from the ceasefire uh, to, um, to a peace agreement. Um, uh, just doing basic education. I mean, we've got a long ways to go. People in this country, it takes a while for people to understand the dynamics in, in a region. Well, I'm just finishing up here. Um, uh, so I think you know, one of the responsibilities in elections, right, is to educate people about what the hell's going on. Uh, so we'll look to you, I mean, those of us on the panel and others, I'm sure are happy to, to speak, and there's lots of resources. Uh, solidarity with the uh, Jeju anti-basis struggle. Um, people going over there, getting, uh, doing, uh, and, and, has, and has been over there, I believe, and, uh, uh, the solidarity is important for it's been maybe the, the most of years. Uh, similarly, uh, solidarity with Okinawa, move money I said, uh, making making common ties with organized labor and others, and opposing the uh, uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, and then just to say the working group, and I put our, our web page there, there's a, a number of resources there. So I've tried to cover a lot uh, quickly, probably too much too fast. Uh, but uh, I hope uh, some of it's useful. They'll work up. Thank you, Joseph. Yeah.